Hey everyone, so that's it. We have come to the last discussion of the Written With Purpose 2021 author series. And I could not think of any better way to end this series but with a discussion with my favorite author, Nello Hopkinson, Grandmaster! Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about Nello Hopkinson, which I shouldn't have to because you watched his channel for more than five minutes and so you should know all about her. But just in case you've been living under a rock, here's who Nello is. Nello Hopkinson was born in Jamaica. She lived in Jamaica, Guyana, the US, and Trinidad before moving to Canada as a teenager. She has published six novels and numerous short stories. Her first novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, won the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest. She has also received the Campbell and Locus Awards, the World Fantasy Award, and the Sunburst Award for Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She currently lives in California, USA, where she is a professor of creative writing and a member of a faculty research cluster in science fiction. In 2018, Eagle Con gave her the Octavia E. Butler Memorial Award in recognition of impactful contributions to the world of science fiction, fantasy, and speculative fiction. She is the author of The House of Whispers, a new graphic novel in Neil Gaiman's Sandman universe. She is currently she has completed and is shopping Black Heart Man, an alternative historical fantasy of the Caribbean. All right. We also know that Nello Hopkinson was recently awarded the, I'm gonna call it the Grand Master Award because they have changed the title, but I still think it's important to recognize that she is a Grand Master of Science Fiction. And I'll tell you a little bit about that award and read the commendation in a second. But I wanna just pause here and say that Nello Hopkinson is my favorite author and she has been for a decade. She's my favorite author, not only because she writes from the perspective of black, queer, uh, people with a number of different ethnicities, that she's Canadian, that she writes so well, that she focuses on Caribbean, Caribbean fables and magical stories, not only because of that, not only because she's an amazing teacher and mentor, not only because of that, not only because she's so nice and kind and generous, not only because of that, but because she's so connected to writing community, cares passionately about creativity. She lifts up other art authors, people who have written before and who are her, her own mentors, up and coming emerging writers, students. She is the consummate artist, the writer, the member of community. Her imagination is exquisite. She's so powerful and encouraging and the worlds she builds are amazing. From high, 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 high fabulous fantasy to like the mundane world where there just happens to be a mermaid. She's amazing. She's got weird fiction. She's got chaotic fiction. She's got science fiction stories. She has more like literary fiction. Like she's just really amazing in what she does and what she writes and I think she's so cool and there was a lot of gushing in this video. Now let's talk about her being a grandmaster. The Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America Incorporated recently announced that Nalo Hopkinson was named the 37th Damon Knight Grand Master for her contributions to the literature of science fiction and fantasy. The Damon Knight Memorial Grand Master Award recognizes lifetime achievement in science fiction and or fantasy. And Nalo Hopkinson joins the Grand Master ranks along legends as, such as C.J. Sherry, Peter S. Beagle, Ursula Le Guin, Anne McCaffrey, Ray Bradbury, and J. Joe Haldeman. The award was presented at the 56th Annual Nebula Conference and Award Ceremony held online in June of 2021. Hopkinson's first novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, was published as the winner of the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest in 1998 
and won the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer and the Locust Award for Best First Novel. She has published five additional novels, including the Andre Norton Award, Writing Sister Mine, and three collections of her short fiction. Hopkinson has also proven herself an adept editor, guest editing an issue of Lightspeed Magazine, and editing five anthologies, including Whispers from the Cotton Tree Root, Caribbean Fabulous Fiction, and So Long Been Dreaming, Post-Colonial Science Fiction and Fantasy. Hopkinson has also won the British Fantasy Award, the Aurora Award, the Gala Galactic Spectrum Award, and the Sunburst Award. She has taught at Clarion East, Clarion West, Clarion South, all the Clarions, and is a professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside, and will soon be a professor at in uh, British Columbia. <clears throat> Nalo's amazing. Huh, this video, this interview is a little bit different from all the others. We're not going to be focusing on a particular work, but I have had the pleasure of talking to Nalo about her winning this award. She's the youngest recipient of the prize. She is 30 years into her writing career and she is not done. She's continuing to write, continuing to produce, continuing to teach. And she talks most importantly, I think, about writing through the difficulties of life. Some of her like most revered work in my view was written while she was homeless, battling disabilities. Like it she's she's incredible and is so honest and transparent about her experiences and that makes her writing even more powerful and important for me. I really hope you enjoy this conversation and I'll see you afterwards. Thank you very much for agreeing to an interview and for, you know, allowing me the opportunity to talk to you and uh, on camera in a recorded context that I'm going to then share uh, with others. I don't take your time or willingness for granted. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that we're here doing this again. Welcome. Thank you for asking me because you keep asking me. It's very cool. I do because <laughs> so this is the thing. Basically, um, there are really like three tasks that I have for this. There are three goals that I have for this interview. There are two things, one thing that I want to say, and then two things I want to ask you, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Basically, any, any interview with you has to just start with me professing my undying bookish love for you. Um, and so I'm obviously starting with that because um, I, you know, I have read all of the things you've written and um, you, you, you changed, like you changed science fiction for me because when I was first introduced to your work many, 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 many years ago, it was the first time I'd seen myself on the page in my city in a way that opened so many doors to me and started me along the path of exploring Black, um, black fiction, in particular, black science fiction and fantasy, and then, you know, fabulous fiction. And, and um, I just, I, I see the impact that you have had uh, on the black SFF canon and on readers and writers. And I just love you. I think you're amazing. And I'm so happy and blessed that you're in the world in my world and in this particular moment here so thank you and i love you and now <laughs> <You too. laughs> for a question question the first thing that i want to talk about um obviously is the fact that you are a grand master um and you Can you hear the music yeah. Don't push me because close to the edge. <laughs> um, you know, and I just I just wanted, I mean, you you're the 37th recipient of the Damon Knight Memorial Grandmaster Award. Um, you're a first in so many ways in terms of the history of the recipients of this award. And I have heard a lot of people talk about what this means to the science fiction. Um, and science fiction fantasy community, but I want to know what this means to you. What does it mean for you to be to have been awarded this award in and and contextually, like in for 2021? So in this particular moment, but also in in this point 
in, in your career, right? So what does it all mean to you? Uh, a lot of what it means for me is, um, and excuse the beeping in the background, <laughs> living in urban environment, not much I can do about it. Uh -huh. um, it means recognition. It means to me that my peers, because Science Fiction Writers of America is science fiction writers pretty much all over the world. It started as America, but um, it means that my peers are seeing what I'm doing and see value in it. Um, that means a lot because uh, 10, 11 years ago, I wasn't sure I would continue to have a career. I was sick. I was unable to write. I was struggling to stay housed and fed. Um, and it means that I have perhaps recovered somewhat from that period because writing coming out of it was hard. And well, writing is always hard. Writing is never easy, not for me. Um, but so there's that. It also means that as I look back at the years of what of who's received that award in CIFWA, I see Science Fiction Writers of America doing some work. And it's not just this award. It's the kinds of initiatives they're doing to, um, to support Black writers, writers of color, Asian writers in the field, uh, and not just established ones, but up and coming ones. I see them doing some work and that has deep value for me. I mean, there's a little bit of, wait, what do you mean I'm the eighth woman to get this thing in what, 40 years? Howl up. <laughs> but then you look back and you can see the changes starting to happen and escalating. Um, so it, it just means a lot of glee. Like I did a lot of happy dancing uh -huh. when I heard. <laughs> um, it means something too, to be the youngest at 60, I'm the youngest to ever receive it. Uh, and I'm not sure what that means, but first of all, it tells me I've done some stuff because you know you can forget in the wash of any endeavor over the course of decades, it can start to feel like I'm in here hanging in, but for them to give it to me at, at 60 means that I've done some stuff in the years since my career started in my 30s. Um, so I don't take it lightly. I don't take it for granted. Uh, it, it's a beautiful thing. And some people have said, does it come with money? It's like, no, it's science fiction. Almost none of us is making money except in the movies. <laughs> but it, it, the recognition is precious. And you, I'm glad you talked about being 60. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to take a couple of things and put them in conversation with each other. So um, I'd like to put your age in con conversation with your stage, right? So I think Brown Girl in the Ring was, um, you know, it, 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 it hit the scene and blew people away. Um, it was oh, your first novel you know, award-winning, you're so young, um, you know, and, and, and new, I think, to, to writing novel length work. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden your first thing drops and everybody's like, what is this? <laughs> what? what are we doing? And, right? and, and to put it in context to age, I was, came out in 95, I was 34 because I hear far too many budding writers. Oh, it's too late for me. I'm over 30. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're in your mid thirties. And so, so your trajectory in terms of starting your writing and then being named, not that, I mean, being named a grandmaster is exceptional. It's incredible. Um, it's not everything, right? Um, it is, it is a huge thing, right? Um, but you, you, you also have a short trajectory in terms of your, from your first book to mm -hmm. being awarded this award, right? Which is, you know, I think that for those of us who aren't as familiar with the award, it's kind of like a lifetime achievement. Very much is, yeah. Honor, right? Yeah. But you're young and <laughs> you're not done writing. Um, and so what does it mean for you to win the award at this particular 
time, and maybe to, to move away from talking about the award necessarily, but where are you at right now in terms of your, um, in terms of your craft? Because you had a, a period of time where you were doing writing on a more frequent basis, and you had another period of your life, as you said, you were dealing with um, health issues, you were underhoused and homeless, um, and then recovering and you wrote, you wrote a book while, while going through that period of time, um, I thought. And then, you know, you're coming, you're coming out of that. You, you wrote some more, then you start to teach, right? And you've been teaching, you moved to California. Um, and so where, where are you at right now? Um, and how are you balancing the teaching with the writing with the reading and with being a part of community. And then of course, just living your life as Nala Hawkinson. Um, imperfectly, <laughs> I mean, how am I balancing it? Have ADHD, have fibromyalgia, have nonverbal learning disorder. Um, I struggle to keep balance in anything. Um, so it's a matter of continuing to try more than finding any kind of balance. Um, teaching is taking up a lot of my mental space uh, during the school year, especially. I enjoy the teaching. It's really, really rewarding. I'm teaching at a university where the student body is overwhelmingly people of color, like overwhelmingly. And we're at the undergrad level, whatever background they come from, for many of them, it's the first time anyone in the family has gone to university. The uh, UCR professors in general, we just love our students. And uh, so I'm enjoying the teaching, but it does take up a lot of brain space for somebody who's not organized and who is scrambling from one week to the other to stay a week ahead of our own students. Um, good thing I know the material better than they do. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that, I do get uh, writing time, I mean, the writing becomes just a thing you do. And if you put down a sentence you've written, right? Um, so I do have the habit of if I get an idea, I scribble it down, I scribble it down so I can go find it later. And I have summers which are fairly long in which to work, but I, I don't wait till the summers. Um, so that's writing, that's teaching, community stuff. Um, I am probably doing less of um, it is part of my job. Those are the three things that make up a, a, a faculty position is writing, teaching and service, right? So a lot of it I'm doing through the campus, but also my speaking engagements are considered service. And often people are asking me to talk about relevant topics to science fiction and the times we're in or to race too. So in that way, I'm still, and I'm mentoring students. Um, balance <laughs> you fall over you get up <laughs> you take another few steps that's basically what balance looks like for me and writing I'm I am not writing as much as I used to or reading nearly as much as I used to no I'm probably reading about the same because reading is now my job but I'm reading stuff that is um uh student work essentially mm. I recently made myself the time and space. I find it really hard to concentrate on writing, right? On, on reading a book right now. I never thought that would happen to me. Yeah. Um, but I, I made myself mental time and space and used so many different, I used audiobook and print book to read and finish uh, N.K. Jemison's The City We Became. Yeah. Always rewarding reading her work. Yeah. Um, but that's the first novel in a long time that I have sat and sort of read through. So the writing's changing. Um, I feel okay about, you know, not churning out a short story every three months. Um, I have just finished a novel that my agent is shopping around and that was, I was writing that through the bad times that took me almost 15 years to finish it through illness and homelessness and struggling back to where we could feed ourselves and changing countries and starting a new job. So I'm very proud of the fact that I finished it. Because mm -hmm. in fact, the first version of it um, was so unfinished that the publisher returned it. Mm -hmm. And I had to find that advance to give them back. 
So I had to get past that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm very, very happy about where I'm at with that. And I've done a couple of interesting short story projects, but also been writing for comics. So I uh, spent two years writing for DC and Sandman universe. And I know I'm going to do more writing for comics because th- that was the thing I wanted to do. So I feel like there's opportunity now to sort of expand my range. Yeah. Um, still always dealing with issues of fatigue and overwhelm and all of that. There's medication that helps some of that. So that you just learn to manage. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. One of the things that I appreciate about you so much is how transparent you are about your life and what writing means, like what your, what your particular writing life looks like. Um, and the cost of writing, right? The, the cost of it, the consequence of um, being a writer um, and the, the work and, and sacrifice that goes into getting the words on the page and then getting it out. Do you have a name yet for the one that is being shopped around or do you, um, can, is that something you can share yet? Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's had a name for 15 years. <laughs> Damn thing is almost ready to go to university. It, uh, <laughs> it's Blackheart Man. <laughs> it's, it's Blackheart Man. Blackheart. And it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's of high school age and experimenting with drugs and sex. And, you know, it's... it's <laughs> what can you tell us about it? Uh, it's an alternate history, fantastical novel set in a Caribbean island that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I, um, in part, I went back and looked at the histories of of, uh, Maronage, of of, uh, enslaved people escaping the plantations and forming their own communities. Mm -hmm. And the fact that those communities were not monolithic, they were not just African people, that that a lot of disenfranchised, not a certain amount of each community would be disenfranchised people from different backgrounds. Might be no women who, you know, uh, just needed to get away from <laughs> that kind of patriarchy yeah. um, or whatever, the disenfranchised. So I looked at what would, I, I'm going to be careful of my language because people have this habit of wanting to think that, that science fiction and fantasy are about being prophetic and they're not. I, I invented a society that had had that experience of marinage mm-hmm. successfully. So the, the, the country that thought they owned them tries to come back and claim them again. And they're able to destroy that army and continue building their community for 200 years. So <laughs> I looked at what that was like. I did a little bit of an overturn of the, the, the social order. So there is a social order because human beings are human beings and, and we will create them. Uh, so put, Taino people at the top of that social order. Um, I am calling them something different. They're equivalent of Taino, they're not exactly. People of African descent uh, uh, next. And then the people who are descendants of the survivors of the army that tried to claim them. So they're largely less call it Mm -hmm. European-ish. Those are the ones who are at the the real bottom of the bottom of the social scale. Mm And I looked at how you would build a society without money. Um, yeah, I shied away from that part for years. <laughs> it's inconceivable for a lot of people. It was for me too. My my uh, my partner kept pushing me to do it, and I kept saying no. And then I thought about it and thought, but really, how would that work? Because as I was trying to make this community, this country, independent of colonialism. Well, the way money is the, 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 how a lot of that gets propagated. Mm-hmm. So how do you do without money yet still trade with the outer world and maintain your independence? I don't know how well I thought it through, but I took it on as an experiment. And so you, you write a book across 15 years You've changed, you've changed, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. From when you started. 
how did the book change with you? How did the story change with you? Well, the thing is when it, it, it was a hot mess up until last summer, it was just pieces mm-hmm. uh, that followed a really rough um, arc because I can't plot for shit. But <laughs> it takes a lot of work for me to get to the plot. So what changed, I think, was um, some of my ideas got more complicated and some of my awareness of what I wanted to put in there uh, came more to the fore. So uh, I put in a few more uh, gender queer characters than I'd had. I had some, but I put in some more. Um, I... looked at power dynamics to see how I could bring some of them to the fore because I know I'm writing I know that racism and sexism are hard to explain to people who think they don't experience it so (laughs) so I tried to to bring some of that out more because both are operating in this community as much as it's a utopian community. Um, they're both there, um, but I don't think it changed too much. It just some ideas got explored a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. That's um, and it, it so that that this novel when it when it comes out, um, and I guess does that mean we would be expecting it in like. 2023 2024 like that he has to buy it first I want to buy it (laughs) I know what you mean well I'm I'm speaking it into thank you (laughs) thank you and thank you for not saying well of course somebody will buy it because that kind of belies all that has to happen and that books don't always get published Right. Books mostly don't get published, in fact. Um, and it sort of seems to assume that once you reach a particular you know, number of books you've published, that nobody's going to say no to you. And that's just not true. You know what? I'm not going to lie that that's, you know, that's there is a, a large part of me that thinks that way. I don't know very much about the publishing industry, so I appreciate that um, soft read. But, I, you know, I, I, I am saying that. There are, I'm waiting, I'm excited, I'm gonna speak it into existence. Thank and you. I can't, I can't, I can't wait. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm burning incense every day for the, the editor who has it now. <laughs> so I wanna to talk to you about teaching because, mm. um, you know, what, what are you, what are, I guess I have, I have two questions about that. One about the students that you're teaching and the kinds of things that they're writing and what's what's exciting you about you know what what's coming out of the imagination right now and then also did teaching for you did it allow you to learn more about yourself as a writer based on just how students are receiving you does it has it changed your your view at all or do you see have you seen it as more of a um you know sharing sharing your knowledge and empowering a new generation of writers to explore their own worlds. Mm, All of that, it works, it works both ways and not just writing and teaching, but also as self. I mean, the um, Grand Master Award also acknowledges my teaching and mentorship through the years, Um, but nobody taught me how to teach. Like I don't have a degree in pedagogy or uh, it's something that I'm learning and still learning and always learning on the fly. Um, So, it's not something I am easy and comfortable about. It's, it's always work. Um, one of the things that is fun about teaching, right now I'm, I'm reading a student's novel that shouldn't bloody work. It shouldn't work. I don't know what magic that person is doing, but it works <laughs> and I'm really not sure why. And I love that, I love it. Um, I am mentoring, the, the thing that I discovered and I'll 
guess I'll find out soon if it's true about Canada too. A lot of the people at the undergrad level and some at the grad level, but mostly undergrad, have very little facility at the sentence level. Mm -hmm. They have a hard time writing down a sentence that means what they want it to. Um, and I'm talking f f uh, people for whom English is their first language. I mean, I have students coming from everywhere, but I actually have, it's less of an issue with the students who've had to learn English. Mm -hmm. um, so that level of competence isn't there and they think we're going to give it to them. But you don't go to an architecture school to learn how to hammer a nail in, right? Yeah, we sort of hope that. that you, yeah. But they're not getting that somehow. And those who are sort of dimly aware of it tend to blame themselves. Hmm. But when I ask them to say what it is they tried to say on the page, the words come out. I said, well, why don't you write that down? <laughs> what? You want what I actually said? Yeah, because I understood that. <laughs> <laughs> and you use the words that, you know, you wanted to use and you got your meaning across, write that. So there's this, oh, but I want, thought you wanted proper English. I'm like, have you met me? No. <laughs> or in fact, any of your profs. Um, so there is that. I don't know how to teach them how to use a comma. I don't know how to teach them what tenses are and how to know what they are or which preposition to use with a so they have to go and learn that themselves and and that's really frustrating for me and for them um, but the, there's this moment that happens and I never know when it's going to happen or who it's going to happen with or if it's going to happen where I say something and a look comes over the person's face and they're reaching for pen and paper or, you know, whatever they write on immediately because something has just come clear to them that was not before. I love that moment. I'm addicted to that moment. Uh, and I have no control over it. All I can do is just keep throwing stuff out there and hope that some things land for some people. Um, so the questions that they ask me are the things that, that I'll, I'll get vexed at something somebody's doing in a piece because they keep doing it. And I wonder, why am I getting so exercised about this? I think, oh, that's because you do it, Nalo. <laughs> but you can see it now that somebody else is doing it. So now you've got to go think about your own practice. Or they'll ask questions about how writing works. And I, they don't realize sometimes how deep those questions are. Like I have to go away and talk to friends who are you know, in the business and think about it and read some books before I can come back and essay a response. Mm -hmm. The thing that's really challenging that, or that I'm thinking about right now is the fact that universities are institutions. They're institutions that have been around centuries. Most of us who are in them now, we're not ever the ones expected to be in them. There is a lot of unfairness that happens in universities. There's a lot of uh, abuse of power that can happen in universities and we are, trained in what to do about it, it took me a while to realize that in a lot of North American universities, the immediate move for the administration is to protect the faculty. Um, so what do I do about, how do I recognize that this is something that I have a responsibility to address and what do I do about it? So all of that goes into it. And, and I think our students think we are teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, that's one third of what I do. See all those books? <laughs> I can get fired if I don't produce more of those. Right? And the committees you don't see. Yeah, we're all on those. Yeah. Yes. So I wonder, I know that um, you're well I'm not I'm not sure and we can obviously edit this out if it's if it's not okay but you are going to be making a change in terms of where you'll be teaching mm -hmm. um, and yes. you're moving back to uh to Canada and teaching teaching you're coming you're coming home I am <laughs> I may say that Canada is your home you're coming home um and what are you what are you looking forward to in in terms of working with a whole new group um of writers in Canada 
I'm looking forward to seeing what's different and what isn't. Um, I'm looking forward to being able to, I mean, at, U, at UCR, I can teach specfic, which is my, my, my expertise. Um, it's not only what people come to me for. So I'm a fiction instructor. That's, they, 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 they divide out the genres very, very broadly into fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. But at UBC, I'm going to be able to say speculative fiction, and that's what people are coming to me for. Um, so that's going to be different. I mean, people come to me for it anyway, but, but having it sort of be part of what's understood yeah. ab about what I teach is cool. Um, there are, uh, it, it'll just be new, it'll be a new environment. There'll be rain. <laughs> There will be rain. Ask, I live in the desert right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ask me a year from now if I'm happy about there being rain in BC. <laughs> and I, I don't know what I'll say. You'll get ocean. You'll get really beautiful views. Depending on where. Depending you are. Yeah. yeah. Vancouver's insanely expensive, so I don't know where we'll be able to live. Yeah. But... Uh, I'll be able to get two beautiful views. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm super excited that you are going to be in Vancouver teaching speculative fiction. That's, that's amazing. And I think at, right now, um, and, and I, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Like, what, what are the themes that, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a global pandemic. Like, how much more spec fit can we get? We're in a, a global pandemic. We have um, state violence all over the world. Um, we are in, in, in Vancouver, you know, themes, I mean, everywhere, but, you know, themes of um, murdered and missing indigenous women and femmes. Um, there's, there's, you know, that all out attack on black communities. Like this is a really powerful moment. And I think fiction helps, um, writing mm -hmm. fiction helps, reading fiction helps uh, because, we need to imagine a way out of this. Like what we've done before is not gonna help us. So I think it's incredible that you're gonna be teaching speculative fiction uh, in this particular time. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for your students. Um, I, they're gonna be so incredibly lucky. So how do you want to leverage this historical moment, right? As you know, whether it's through your own writing as it happens or through your teaching or mentoring or so on, what do you think speculative fiction has to, to give us right now? Same things it always did, which is um, models for thinking about social change, um, models for thinking about catastrophic change because both are happening like state violence volcano <laughs> literally uh, yeah yeah literally plus pandemic yeah. um so hopefully models for healing not just individually but uh in communities and models for community action, for communities being self-directing, for the, the possibilities communities have for making change. Uh, those are all there in both science fiction and fantasy and have always been there. Um, a lot of what my students ask me is how do you do world building and how do you infuse uh, your own culture into it? Mm. I actually, I'm not sure it's a question I'm that good at answering. You know, some things you, you it's not like I just do it, it's that I know I have the permission to do it. Um, so I'm expecting a lot more questions along those um, lines. Um, but also a lot of what undergrads fear is that their ideas are too outre or too brown or too queer or too, you know, uh, people are going to be offended if I write about a serial killer. It's like, 
yeah, but you have the idea to write about a serial killer because you've been watching TV. <laughs> um, so giving people permission, I expect I'll have to continue doing a lot of that. Saying, no, no, you, you can the hell write about that. Um, yes, it's scary. Yes, there might be repercussions. Yes, you might say something that is just offensive as hell. But in the moment, it's just you and that screen or you know piece of paper. Uh, so write it and then think about it. So I expect to be doing a lot more of that um, and maybe introducing people to texts they have not been introduced to, which means I have to get back in my reading game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what excites you about the state of Black science fiction and fantasy right now? Let's get started on your uh, syllabus. So what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's exciting you um, in, within, uh, I mean, genre fiction is such a contested term and like concept anyway, but what, what do you want to not only expose students to, but just like for, for yourself, how is, the, how is Black SFF changing and what do you want to explore? Well, for one thing, there's more of us getting published. Yeah. So that alone is a sea change. Um, so where I used to have to go and find books and look for clues, you know, is this person a person of color or are these characters, are there any characters of color in here? Um, I had a, used to have one shelf in my bookshelf for uh, uh, science fiction, fantasy, magical realism, whatever, writers of African descent. And now I could probably, I need more shelves. <laughs> I need whole bookcases. And that is amazing. And it's happening in different media as well. So not just in print prose, but in comics, in films, in games. Um, that's really exciting that I can uh, pick up a comic where the main character is a young black girl who is the most intelligent person in the on the planet and who has a pet dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so I can teach Moon Girl. Um, that that's exciting. That um, you know, my my colleagues, my friends, my peers are coming out with new work all the time, uh, and there's a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and watching students' eyes light up, because um, even if they're not from that background, most of them want to write this stuff because they're interested in ideas and they're interested in whether or not they, they think of it that way, they're interested in alterity. Mm -hmm. um, so they get excited when they see, oh, wow, you can write, you know, a graphic novel set in modern day Nigeria. <laughs> um, and, and I can, it's, it's, I don't only focus on blackness, but I can bring in Caribbeanness, uh -huh. which is a much different. Yes, black Caribbeanness, but it, it we're talking realized societies in ways that the North doesn't tend to understand. Yeah. So, and there's more and more of us every day. Um, I can talk about. Uh, uh, Queer writing, trans writing, I, if you name it, it's science fiction. I can do anything. <laughs> and those books are getting published, which is so nice. Yeah. I, I since, since starting BookTube um, in 2017, I've become a lot more knowledgeable about writers um, um, around the world and different parts of the world, right? Like they're and right, right now, my priority is reading more Caribbean writers of like speculative fiction. And I know that there's a long history um, of writers in the Caribbean and then structural issues that impact um, whether books get published in the Caribbean uh, mm -hmm. for writers who still are in the Caribbean. Yeah, language, for instance. Suppose you're writing in Papiamento. Yeah. Where are you going to get published? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not so much that, but who's going to see it? Yeah. For sure. Um, and then Australia is also a place where I'm learning about, you know, speculative work, uh, black speculative work. And so that's super exciting too. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, and just watching the kinds of sensibilities that are happening. Have you seen the film Space Sweepers? I haven't. And I'm going to forget the, the Korean director's name, but it imagines a multilingual future where people just sort of walk around with the translation, translators. So you speak in your own language and other people understand. So there's a scene where um, you don't see this character at first, he's off screen and you hear what he's saying. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that's not Jamaican. That's a, this man is speaking Nigerian pigeon. Please, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're hoping that it's not just, you know, the, the director hasn't just imported the language and put it in someone else's mouth and the camera turns and it's a black man speaking Nigerian pidgin, yeah. doing his job, talking to people who don't speak it. And I'm like, I was so happy. I was so happy. <laughs> I just looked it up um, and directed by Joe Sung Hee. And... Joe Sung Hee. Yeah. So that's... I don't, yeah, that's all the information I was able to get. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. It's a 2021 film, it looks yeah. like. Okay. He wrote it. He wrote it too. Oh, okay, he did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to see that sensibility there, mm-hmm. um, just, you know, makes my little heart go warm and shoulders go down from the ears just a little bit, just a little bit. Because the next thing you read in the news is going to put them back up, but... <laughs> Do you think that there are issues or um, questions that we haven't yet tackled in SFF that we that are urgent right now or that we need to explore? I don't know. Um, and it it. It feels like people will come up with those ideas whether or not I am, you know, saying, oh, I need to see this. So I wait to be surprised. Um, And there's always something. I want to see a lot more um, attention given to First Nations writers. Um, That's one thing that I think could be happening more, attention and support. Um, and some translation continues to be a big problem. There's work happening all over the world that I will never read as somebody who's primarily Anglophone. I speak enough French to be able to read it. I could probably with a dictionary, you know, will head my way through Russian, but uh, I'm very, very thankful for, one of the issues that's coming up that's systemic is, um, subtitles. So I'm watching media from other countries with the subtitles where I don't speak the language. And uh, subtitling is not given enough attention to, I mean, even in English, where they'll give somebody who doesn't speak any, uh, doesn't understand any English, British, UK, Irish, Scottish slang, and but they're doing the subtitling and what they come out with has nothing to do with what the actor just said. <laughs> So um, translation, subtitling, the stuff that lets us have more conversations with each other across and through languages, I think is a big issue. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I'm excited. Um, I'm excited about the years ahead. I'm excited about um, what this particular historical moment is forcing us to have to imagine. Um, I think, how are we gonna fix this is a question that, you know, I I just, I don't know what the answer is, but I know that it's a question that a lot of people are thinking about right now. And, you know, I've read books about global pandemics. I've read books about tsunamis. I've read books about all of the things that are happening right now. And, you know, some people are surviving it. Some people are not. Um, and we're, we're, we're in a moment that, you know, three or three years ago, I would have said it was fiction. Like if somebody said, and Jerry, do you think you're going to live through a global pandemic in your life? I would have said no three years ago, right? Mm. I I literally would have been like, 
I mean, it's conceivable, but I doubt it. As a science fiction writer, I would have said, please, God, I hope not, because we've been writing that stuff and it's ain't pretty. <laughs> but, but I wouldn't have said it's not going to happen. And the next one's coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool now. And, um, and I find myself going back and looking at, at books that I've read to see how did they survive it? You know, what did, what did these characters do? Oh, okay. You know, I've been thinking about Lauren Alamina's Ready Pack. Um, I've been thinking about, um, you know, chosen community. I've been thinking about hygiene, personal hygiene and diet and um, cooking and planting. And, you know, those, just those skills. I've been thinking about bicycles and oil yeah. and just like a lot of different things. I mean, not in any kind of organized oh God, no. in a prep kind of way, because Though I do have a bow bag because I live in Southern California. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Yes. Um, I did not have one until the pandemic hit. And I'm like, you're going to put pandemic on top of fire and earthquake? Yeah. I, I got to go back now. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so I just think it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing time. So I want to circle back now to where we started, which is that, um, you know, your, your recognition, your recognition, to, uh, for your contribution to science fiction um, around the world um, as a writer, as a teacher, and also as a member of the community. You, you, like, you lift up others. Every time we've spoken, you've talked about another writer's work or a filmmaker's work, and um, you're such an important part of the community and you like support that community. And I think that that's such an important it's such an important model, right? And I think that's what allows more writers and to write, right? Just to know that they're going, they're going to be held in that. They're going to be challenged and held. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you have any, not necessarily like tips, but have you seen some best practices for um, novice Black SFF writers who, you know, want to make connections, want to learn their craft, don't exactly know how to do that. And I ask this because BookTube is made up of readers and, you know, it's only a blink before the reader um, starts to think about, could I actually write this stuff? Or Yes, you can. <laughs> so what, what, what would you say to people who were just like, you know, I really wish Nalo Hopkinson would give me some tips on how to get started. <laughs> what would you <laughs> Do not send me your book. <laughs> yeah, no. I have one waiting in my inbox right now and I'm waiting to find the right words to tell the person, mm, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thing is, information is out there. Those of us who are working full-time in it, before that was me, I could not comprehend how somebody couldn't take a few minutes and read a short story by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And now I totally know. Um, so I would say, see if that person has a blog, because often they're putting that information on their blog. They're essentially putting up um, tutorials for you. Uh, some people are doing it using video. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yes, there's uh, besides courses like I know that you can take like writing the other courses by um, yeah, Nisi, Nisi and, and, and uh, Christina, yes, um, and um, Temp Tempest. Um, so you can do that. You can, um, and I wouldn't limit myself to trying to get advice from people who are like you. Sure, go to them because they have experience that is similar to yours yeah but um something like the writing excuses podcast um that's done has been being done for years by a group of writers and they have frequently have guests um there's amazing information on that it's free um and you're getting it from the, the lips of people who are doing this for a living. Um, apply for something like Clarion. It is expensive. There are scholarships. Uh, if, if, you know, going and 
living on a campus for six weeks is a thing you can at all manage to do, consider applying. Um, but also go to the CIFO website, Science Fiction Writers of America. And there is tons of free information on there and not all of it written by middle-class white people. And even some of it that is, is excellent, excellent advice. Um, so I find what happens in the world of social media particularly is that people feel tentative. They want to learn, they don't know who to ask. So they ask their friends and their friends are as ignorant as they are, but want to help. So they come up with an answer and that thing gets out in the world as though it's true. Right. Don't ask people who have the same level of not knowing as you do, right? You just circulate that disinformation round and round and round. Mm -hmm. um, people love to give information. There's all kinds of stuff on YouTube, like what you do, where you get, you know, you're, you're talking to people in the industry and you're talking about the books. Read the books, read the short stories, read and read and read and read. And the thing that I often advise people to do that so far nobody has done, take a story you like, where you know it's doing something brilliant, but you can't really tell what. Take about five to 10 pages of it and type them out. Word for word, punctuation mark by punctuation mark, rewrite them. You will I've never learn heard that before. so much. I have heard it before, but it tends not to be popular advice. But I, it's, it's happened to me where I was reading a Wilson Harris short story that I wanted to publish and I knew it was smart, but I couldn't tell why many, many years ago. And he'd sent it to me. Um, it was a, a Xerox, uh, he was using a typewriter. So the Xerox of the typewritten page, uh, I had to scan it. And that those days scanning technology I could afford was not that good. So I got a lot of gobbledygook. So I had to sit down and type it out from the original. And by the time I got done typing it, I figured out what it was he was doing. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant, but I knew why by the time I got done. <laughs> That's really amazing. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it helps so much. Um, so you can be self-taught. You don't need to go to a university. You don't need to uh, pay money if you don't have it but you do have to look for the information and look for where the information is coming from. Yeah. Uh, and if it's, if it's just somebody with an opinion, go look for second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth opinion. Right. Yeah. Thank and you. go to events, event, especially now in, in these times, a lots of events are free and online mm -hmm. as you meet like-minded people and you meet sometimes the writers whose work you're interested in. Um, and it's a social environment where you can talk to folks. Yeah. Thank you for that. I want to, um, I knew that for this, this conversation, this is the second time we've, we've done an interview for this, like for Onyx pages, but I wanted to really, um, I wanted to get at what was being recognized, right? Um, in addition to, in addition to your writing, um, this, this recognition is about, at least from my perspective, as somebody who's followed your work for decades, from my perspective, um, in addition to your, your writing, which is beautiful and exquisite and evocative, and I could talk about it for so long, um, that your person, like your generosity of spirit, your kindness, um, your, um, it's even like your just willingness to be like, this is who I am in the world. These are all of my identities and I'm here doing the work. It's not easy. And, um, and I work hard, hard at it. Like, I'm so happy that somebody that I know, somebody that I've loved for so long, you know, is, you know, is being held up in this particular way. Like, I'm so proud of you. And I'm, I thank you for, you know, talking about, about this, right? Talking about the teaching, the community building, um, this historical moment that, that we're in um, and, and just what it means to be alive, alive in this right now. It's not perfect, but it can be, 
it can be terrible. It can be beautiful. So Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the time that you spent speaking with me and um, I'm crossing all the appendages uh, (laughs) for the novel and I can't wait for you to be back in Canada (laughs) and that's super, super exciting. So I want to thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can I add one more thing? Always. Because you talk about working hard and yes, I do. But what that looks like with somebody who needs frequent brain breaks and a lot of isolation and a lot of solitary time is can be 15 minutes of work and two hours of watching Torchwood. Because <laughs> <laughs> I need the, 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 the brain break, the body break, the, you know. Yeah. So when I say working hard or I'm too busy, it doesn't mean I'm filling every minute of every day with concentration I I do not own enough concentration to do that even with meds Um, and and I say that because a lot of people hold themselves up to these impossible standards and don't realize they're doing it yeah Uh, and so I want to be careful about how I talk about how I work Mm -hmm. so that they know that there's no oh I couldn't possibly do this because I don't you know write 5,000 words a day (laughs) That, that would be me. <laughs> hey everyone, I hope that you enjoyed my discussion with Nalo Hopkinson. She's just amazing. I'm not gonna lead any with any reflection questions or anything like that. I just wanna hear what your thoughts are and what you know hopes you have for what she hits us with next. Okay, I'm going to choose the last card from the Harvest of Survival Affirmation deck. And let's see what we come up with. Belief initiates and guides action, or it does nothing. Belief initiates and guides action, or it does nothing. This is a quote from Octavia E. Butler. And here's the reflection question. What is an idea you are holding closely that needs to be seen in the world? And I feel like this question is like directed toward me, even though it's for all of you as well. But what is an idea you are holding closely that needs to be seen in the world? I think this is a great question to answer right now because this series that is wrapping up right now, right in this moment, is an idea that I felt needed to be seen in the world. I think that we need more opportunities for black science fiction and fantasy writers to be lifted up, to be thanked, to be approached with gratitude and with humility and honor because the work is so important, especially now. So I would love to hear your answer to that question in the comments below. And if you answer that question and do three other things, you will be entered into a draw in order to win one of the Melon and Eclectic Planners from 2022. So number one, like this video. Number two, subscribe to this channel. Number three, share this video and number four, answer the prompt question, which again is, what is an idea you are holding closely that needs to be seen in the world? All right, everyone, thank you so much for being a part of this journey. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and your responses. I would like to thank all of the authors, all of their publicists, all of the publishers and agents and assistants and everybody who helped make this happen. It took a lot of planning, it took a lot of dedication, a lot of pivoting, and we were able to make it happen. So I wanna thank everyone for participating. I'd also like to thank my Tomi Tomi, my wife, my Ride and Thrive for being here through all of it, for just supporting this space, for helping me figure out how I was gonna put it all together, for just letting me do my thing um, um, to make this happen. So thank you very much, baby, for being amazing. I'd also like to thank my close friends, Brittany from Melanin Eclectic, Tatiana from Musical Tati, Noria from Chronicles of Noria, Sherry from Obsidian Texts and Tangents, my booktube friend crew for just being here through all of it, for making amazing content and for supporting what turned into this very, 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 very huge endeavor 
And also, you might notice that I am not home and there's a lot of echo. There wasn't an echo. E echo. I'm in the Artscapes Gibraltar Point open space. This is where I have spent one week in August batch filming everything, editing all of my videos, putting it all together, creating the voice work, and just being here with you. It's been amazing. I'm gonna be premiering all of these videos so there'll be an opportunity to talk to you, but I'm very privileged to have this opportunity to be on Toronto Island to engage in this project. Thanks everyone for being a part of it. Remember to read with purpose, and I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>